Hi team, Dr. Jay Cordy here, and today I'm going to be taking you through light microscopy. Now the reason is, is light microscopy is a very important technique, and we don't, we don't often stop and appreciate it. My previous video, I covered a 2002 Nobel Prize winners who pretty much just used a microscope for most of their techniques to make their discoveries. Um, and so I think we often use it without underappreciating it, and I know I do, because I'm going to be straight with you, I see it. Hey, I don't know how a phase contrast microscope works. I'm going to make a video about it. So then I have to learn it. Um, and then I will share what I have learned with the world. And I, I've used phase contrast microscopes every week of my research career for 12 years um, and loved them. They're a fantastic microscope. They're only a slight alteration to a regular microscope. So a lot of regular microscopes have the op option to just flick on phase contrast. Then, as I began to research how they work, I realized it is incredibly complicated how a phase contrast microscope worked. How to implement it is flick and flick, it takes two seconds, but how it physically works, it's so complicated, but I gave it a go. So here we go, light microscopes, and in particular, phase contrast microscopes. I got this guy here just to show you how simple a regular light microscope is. It's just a tube full of magnifying glasses, nothing fancy. Over here, this is basically that, just with a few extra options, okay? So let's jump into light mic microscopy. Now, before I wanna jump into that, I wanna jump into magnifying glasses. Now, just so we can understand how a lens works. Now, the actual physical reality of this is incredibly complicated. In fact, I bet you it's quantum physics-y kind of complicated, right? So what I'm going to give you is heuristics. Now, heuristics, we use heuristics all the time, day to day. It's sort of like a simple bunch of rules that work most of the time. It's a good way to understand it, even though it may not be incredibly accurate, right? Um, uh, you know, it's hard to think of examples, but a lot we use heuristics every single day. And so um, it's, it's, it's just a great strategy to manage very complicated topics is to just try and think of it in a simple way that is useful and that is a heuristic. So I'm going to tell you everything I'm about to say is a heuristic around about how microscopy and magnifying glasses and lenses and phase contrast works. So let's go through the first heuristic, right? So here we have a person standing here. Light is going to leave the top of this person's head, go into the eye. Let's ignore the lenses of the eyes. That complicates things. And light is going to go from the toe down here into the eye and be detected. And this is going to generate an angle. We can draw these lights as lines. And here we have this angle. This angle dictates the apparent size of the image, right? The person to us will appear six foot tall because of this angle here. If we put um, a C. elegans nematode over here and we go from the head of the C. elegans and the tail of the C. elegans, we can see that this angle of entry of light into our eyes is very tiny. Remember, this is just a heuristic. So that tells us the size of that C. elegans. So what do lenses do? Well, lenses use the property of light interacting with the surface of glass and air to bend light. So here we have a lens here, it's convex on both sides. This is a typical lens. Um, and now, oh, my animations are appearing in the wrong order. The light can actually, light, remember, is going in all directions, right? So the light, there is light going up. This light will hit the angles of each of these lenses and bounce back down and enter the eye. And now you can see that the angle of the light, this headlight goes up and then down again, it gets bent by the lens down. Normally this would miss the eye and we wouldn't see it, right? We would only see the light that comes dead straight and that would create that tiny angle. But now we're seeing the light that's bouncing off and going and scattering way out and then coming back in again. And so now the angle of entry into light is now big. It's in fact bigger than a human, right? Um, and we can do this cute little thing where we can draw these lines out to generate the uh, perceived image. So this would be the perceived size of the C. elegans through this lens. Now there's a, a lots of formulas about where you should put that. 
like if you move that across to over here if you move that across over here it would appear smaller there's lots of formulas to the lengths of these lines when you're generating the perceived image but this is basically the principle of how magn magnifying glasses and how lenses work and microscopes can just be seen as stacks of lenses to maximize magnification right and increase that angle of entry into your eye so that when your eyes are super close to those lenses we can now see very steep angles into our eyes therefore making the perceived angle or some perceived size of something very small incredibly large right and this is all just a heuristic but it is a relatively good way to imagine what's happening now another important heuristic is that every lens has a has a focal point in which things will be in focus so if we move our eye too close suddenly the lines aren't meeting at a point and so they will be out of focus again this is just a heuristic it's just a simple way to understand this now i think we kind of all understand that especially if you had my childhood of burning stuff with magnifying glasses and the sun you understand that each lens has that perfect length away from something in which all the light from very far out is now focus into a single point and you can imagine that the perceived uh, angle of the sunlight here is going to be really steep here um, and so it is magnifying the sun okay so those are some key heuristics going on here now there's a few more heuristics so light isn't actually a line it is a wave and the wave length dictates the color so red is a large wavelength and other colors are small wavelengths and that means their wavelength means that they interact with certain things um, differently and that is how we perceive color right so uh, let's undergo, let's have a quick look at the parts of the microscope. This is super boring. Uh, I'm really sorry, but it's just kind of something that we've got to go through, right? So there's a light source, and then there's a condenser. The condenser shapes the light. Now it can also, um, it also magnifies the light and focuses the light onto your tissue, right? So you don't have disorganized scattered light, and you've also got maximum light um, hitting that. Now you can reduce that with a brightness adjuster down here, to lower the light source because sometimes if it's too much light everything looks white it's overexposed for your eye uh, there's a stage and the stage can be uh, adjusted with these controls and you get really good at this over time into using your intuition to know how to move the stage um, to get to certain locations on the slide now the stage can be lowered up and down now remember each lens has a specific point which it focuses to so it's important to be able to focus by changing where the specimen is in distance from the lens right so that's why the stage can go up and down now there's a course adjuster to get it to the focus really quickly and a fine adjuster which is the little knob which you move very very tightly to make minor adjustments um, and when you're on those objective lenses that sit really close to the glass side it's best to use the fine adjustment you start with a low mag lens course adjust get it in focus go to a higher mag lens use fine adjust but if you want uh the 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 honest truth is most scientists use the large coarse magnify uh, coarse focus and they just get really good at moving at very small amounts well that's what i do anyway i'm, I'm a rebel um, so these objective lenses have just had more lenses in them um, to get greater magnification um, and different kinds of lenses and so you can go from four times to uh, 60 times for example and then you have the eyepiece lenses now importantly not a lot of people do this but some people have slight differences between their eyes and so each eyepiece you can adjust the focal length just a little bit each piece yeah so that's the microscope okay boring but here's the question what are we seeing what are we seeing with a light microscope here we can see some beautiful chloroplasts here and this is from a plant um, and we can see those rigid cell walls one of the differences between plant and animal cell walls what are we seeing so we're seeing green and we're seeing green because the other colors are being absorbed and so green is the only light that isn't being absorbed by the chloroplast and so that is what we see the other wavelengths are now gone but there's a problem most cells don't contain pigments like chloroplasts don't contain don't contain anything that absorbs a lot of light in fact 
mostly it absorbs almost no light. So if we have a look at this cell, uh, this is a cell under the microscope, we can barely see anything there, right? It's all washed out. And that's because phospholipid membranes, even DNA, mitochondria, these things aren't good at absorbing any wavelength of light. So we don't see any colors and we don't see any darkness, which is a lack of light. So how did we get these beautiful images here? The, these are some neurons here grown in culture. These are some yeast cells budding and they look beautiful. And so how do we get those images if the materials aren't absorbing a lot of light? And the answer is phase contrast microscopy. This is what we look at living cells under the microscope with. Now, this involves some high level physics. So I'm going to have to, not high level, okay, moderate level, okay, low level, low level physics, but I'm a biologist. So for me, this is blowing my mind, right? Okay, so it's about understanding waves, right? So there are um, waves can, two waves can interact in different ways. They can either be constructive or destructive or somewhere in between. So here we can actually see two waves coming together and at one point they end up in constructive interference, i.e. the two waves are constructing on top of each other, building a construction or adding to each other. And so they make an even bigger wave which tosses this body border miles in the air. That'll teach him for not being a surfer. Okay, so let's have a look at that um, a bit closer together. So here we have two waves. If we were to get these waves to interact with each other, because they're in sync, they're in sync together, they would add to each other. And that's constructive interference. It's weird that they have the term interference. Um, I agree, but it's constructive interference. I suppose it's changing the wave. It's interfering with the wave in a constructive way. So it makes it bigger. And this happens when the waves are in phase so they're, they're together they're waving at the same time they peak when they peak together and they trough when they trough together now this is destructive interference with the waves where there's a peak there is a trough if we were to add those two together we get a flat line this is destructive interference and it's because they're out of phase now you can see that word popping up phase that has something to do with how this microscopy works, doesn't it? Yeah, because it's phase contrast microscopy. And it's all to do with this process of constructive um, interference, which would make something brighter, and destructive interference, which would make something darker, because it destroys the light wave, right? So here's a cool thing. You can shift the phase of light. Um, uh, different molecules shift the w waves of light, different liquids as light transitions from um, uh, trans transitions from one material to another, it can shift. Um, it would, so it could shift from a destructive interference pattern, which is what we've got here. You could shift it just half a wavelength and now you've got constructive uh, interference going on here. So if you shift the wavelength just a little bit, you get constructive interference which is bright, rather than destructive interference, which is dark. Okay, so let's look at how a normal microscope works, and then we'll look at how a phase contrast microscope works. So here we have the basic setup. The light comes in, now there's a condenser lens here, it condenses the light in to hit the sample. It hits the sample and goes out to a lens, which then angles it back into the eye. So this angle here, tells, um, essentially manipulates the light, and so this angle is then inferred as giant, a giant cell, right? Because that angle dictates the apparent size of an object, right? So what are we seeing? Well, we're trying to see light that's being blocked out. So maybe a dense nucleus could block out a tiny little bit of light, so there would be less light going through this zone, and so that would be a dark spot on the eye, and now we've seen the nucleus, okay? So that is roughly how a light microscope works. Again, there's all heuristics. It's a simple way of understanding that's useful, but it may not be 100% accurate. So here we have a phase contrast microscope. Now there's a few differences here. First of all, we have this thing just blocking out most of the light except for these two slots here. Now these two slots, we're actually seeing a cross section is actually a ring. So he's got this thin ring 
um, around it and when you cut when you do a cross section through it, it looks like two little arms but it actually works like two separate beams but just imagine those two separate beams are now rotating in 360 but it actually makes sense to understand it in a two-dimensional image and then up here we have something similar um, with a little gap that lines up with this little gap but we also have this little semi-transparent plate here called a phase plate <clears throat> and i'll go into what that does in a second so the light's going to come up most of it's going to get blocked and then it's going to get focused by that lens i don't have that lens there because i don't want to complicate things but it gets focused by the length and it illuminates it now i've got it illuminating just a small spot but remember the cell's going to be absolutely tiny so it's going to illuminate the whole sample but i've got it just illuminating one spot so we can see what's happening um, the most of the light is just going to go straight through back to these gaps and then that's going to go up to the lens and back into the eye so that light is doing relatively normal things in fact this light is doing exactly what the outer bunch of this light would be doing right so it's following the same path as normal light but some of that light is scattered now over here we've got a shadow that's blocking or absorbing the light that's very difficult to do but it's quite easy to move light angles just a little bit if you've ever seen a drinking straw going into a glass of water you'll notice how it moves the light just a little bit so scattering light and moving light a little bit is easier than um, especially when you've got uh, transitions from water to phospholipid back to water again they, the, those kinds of things are much easier to do than to fully absorb the light um, which is what's required to cast a shadow so we're going to end up with some scattered light that don't quite hit those perfectly aligned gaps on the other side and this scattered light is going to go into this magical thing called a phase plate and it's essentially just a semi-transparent thing it's a transparent thing that's made out of a compound that shifts the phase of the light okay so it shifts it by half a step now I've, I've, I've demonstrated that as a color change but it wouldn't actually change the color that's wavelength it's shifted the phase of the light so it's moved it along a bit and now it combines together just as it enters the eye now as it combines this is going to be destructive interference because the scattered light has been phase shifted by this phase plate so it's going to appear dark right so it, it kind of blocks out a lot of the light right and that's because of this magical thing called a phase plate causing this phase shift in wavelength now if you think you're there we're not there yet there's another step to this to make this whole system work okay this thing is called an annulus and that's because it's a ring annual like the year like the earth going around the sun it's a ring um so it's an annulus it's a little disc of ring that only lets that peripheral light come in at a steep angle right so here's part two that would make this whole system make sense certain locations in a cell can also shift the phase in particular where the membrane interacts with the water right so at a very narrow focal plane a cell has a membrane that interacts with the water and we've got essentially a surface here right we've got um, phospholipids here then we've got water on the inside and water on the outside this zone right here has the molecular properties that are able to shift the phase along a bit and so what happens is the wavelength as it goes through the edge of the cell phase shifts by half a step so now it's out of phase so let's see what would happen to that in our setup so we've got our normal system over here light comes up light crosses over light hits the eye but there's the scattered light getting out of phase causing destructive interference to make it dark right so we've got some darkness right there now i moved the cell across just for the diagram purpose but remember the cell is going to be absolutely tiny and the whole cell is going to be illuminated simultaneously but this way we can just look at it piece by piece to see what's going on so the light comes up it comes across it hits that edge of the membrane water interface on the edge of the cell now this scat so the regular light most of the light is still going to go through and follow the regular part but the scattered light is now going to be out of phase because remember this part this membrane water interface these the molecules around the edge of a cell can 
put the wavelength out of phase. So now it's out of phase before it hits the phase plate. But now it hits the phase plate, which moves it again by half a wavelength. And now it's in phase, right? So in this example, the scatter light has once remained in phase and then it went out of phase and caused destructive interference up here. But in this example, it went out of phase, then back into phase and caused constructive interference. Oh boy, I didn't realize I was going to be explaining this when I got into phase contrast microscopy. Yes. Oh boy, it's some intense science. It's cool though. Okay, so... Um, I'm so glad I now know and understand it, right? So in this example, um, when it hasn't gone through the edge of the cell, we have destructive interference, it's out of phase, it's going to be dark, right? Because this phase plate has shifted the scattered light. Over here, the scattered light had already been shifted by the cell itself, and so then when it was shifted again, it was shifted back into phase. And so now it's constructive interference, and it's going to appear bright. So, we got there. That is intense. I'm sorry, guys. That's 0 to 100 when it comes to science. But I'm so glad I personally know how it works. As long as you understand some of those fundamental principles of phase shifting, um, I think you hopefully get a good grasp on it. Honestly, I couldn't find a good video on YouTube anywhere about this. I had to do some deep diving to, to figure this all out. Right, so now let's have a look at some phase contrast images. Um, here we have some nice round cells. Here we have some like neuron looking like cells, dendritic kind of cells, and some more round cells. And what can you see? You can see where the membrane interacts with the water. You see this very bright ring because of that constructive interference. Super bright. And in the nucleus, you can see it's a bit darker because we've got that destructive interference going on there. Um, and so now we can really see the cells absolutely pop. So whenever we do cell counting, we always use uh, phase contrast microscopy. Um, it's just a fantastic way to view cells really easily under the microscope. Remember, it's ultimately to overcome the problem that cells don't absorb a lot of light, right? Unlike, um, uh, you know, unlike my cell phone, which absorbs a huge amount of light that hits it because it's black. Um, a, a, a cell, not a cell phone, a cell isn't dense enough. It doesn't have enough molecules in there to allow it to interact with the photons coming in. So it cannot cast a shadow. So we overcome that by manipulating the property that the cell seems to be able to shift the phase of light without blocking it. Wow, Whee! there's phase contrast microscopy. I did it, I feel great. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It's 11 o'clock at night um, and I'm signing off. Get you.